Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back to Peak Human Podcast. This is Brian Sanders. I want to encourage everyone to go back to episode one, or at least work your way backwards through all the great episodes. Also share with family or friends, and please give it a review on iTunes or the podcast app. That always helps people find it. It helps this podcast look a little more legit. Just a few updates. We're making great progress on the Sapien Health and Wellness Center, the ancestral community we're starting here in Austin. The property is right here in East Austin, close to my place, close to downtown. It's got all the amenities. It's got the nose to tail products. It's got co-working space. It's going to have a food truck. I have an amazing chef, the nose to tail chef of the century. He's coming over again to make some delicious pate, pickled pork hearts, Lengua tacos, oh my God, it's amazing. We're also gonna have an outdoor gym, a fire pit, an outdoor barbecue area with open fire cooking, sauna, cold plunge, events, music, so much more, so much more. Please contact me if you wanna get involved, hi at foodlies.org. We're still looking for anyone from potential members. We're gonna have community build days to get this all going and built out to investors. If you wanna get in on this vision because we're gonna take this across the country eventually. I'd love to hear where you wanna see the next one. We're thinking Nashville or Denver. I wanna hear where you think it should be, where we have the biggest community. We're also doing a version of the decentralized food system that I mentioned a long time ago with a good friend of mine with some technology. We're gonna use an app to get local food and local goods out straight to people without the middleman, without the big Amazon stuff from China. We're talking just local goods to your local community. So we're looking for people to get involved with that as well. So contact me, hi at foodlies.org. And now on to my show with Dr. Jessica Thompson. She's an amazing researcher who's out there in the field doing the real work, digging up the bones, looking at the cut marks, looking into how much fat our ancestors ate. She is going to be in the Food Lies film, and here is a little bit more about her. Specializing in human evolution and the aspects revealed through the analysis of ancient animal bones, Jessica Thompson is a leading voice in paleoanthropology, evolutionary theory, and hunter-gatherer ethnography. She also leads the Malawi Ancient Lifeways and Peoples Project in Malawi in Central Africa to develop and interpret the evolutionary history in the area during the last ice age. Such a fun conversation. She also did a great presentation called The Fat of the Land. I'll link to that in the show notes. She's a professor at Yale. She's actively doing this research. Pretty much as we speak, she's going back to Africa in a month or two. This discussion is really great. Like all my podcasts, I think they kind of get better as they go. You have to listen to the whole episode. They really do seem to crescendo at the end when we get on a roll, when we get into some of the most interesting topics. So, of course, listen to the whole thing. Share with a friend. Give it a review on iTunes. And before before we begin, I got to mention my company knows the tail. Got to support all the great ranchers here in Texas. We got the grass fed, grass finished, regeneratively raised meats. We have the low PUFA fed pork and chicken. They get the special diets, corn free, soy free, organic. All of our animals are raised the best way possible with the soil health in mind, with the best practices, with holistic management, rotational grazing all of that stuff. Get the primal ground beef, which is a nose to tail ground beef, which has a liver, heart, kidney, and spleen mixed in. Such a good way to get in those nutrients. We got the bones, we got bone broth, pre-made. We have other products for, if you're on the go, the biltong and the drovors. These are South African specialties. This is the way they do it over in South Africa. It's air dried slowly instead of dehydrated at a high heat, like normal jerky. And it also doesn't have all the weird additives and sugar they add to normal jerky. Great stuff. We have the liverors, which is drovors with liver in it, 30% liver. So that's an awesome way to have a tasty treat with liver baked in. And by baked, I mean slowly air dried at a low temperature. We also have the body care products, getting some new soap in right now. Still waiting on the other ones. Sorry to tease those once again. This is all at nosetail.org. We have free shipping options for the other stuff if you spend over $60 and we pay for half your shipping on the fresh meat orders. It's super expensive to ship meat, so we pay for half. A great deal. We also have the seasonings. I love these. I use them every day. There's always a way to get them in the different meats I cook, like the Thai one on the lamb. That's always good. And we even have hats. There's a steak hat in the background. If you're watching on video, it's just a big old T-bone on a hat. We also have the word steak written on a hat. We also have the nose to tail hats. I wear this every day playing beach volleyball. It's great. It's great talking to these random volleyball players about meat. I'm spreading the good word. Actually, one guy I played with knew me. He knew Food Lies. It was awesome. So that's it. Thanks for listening. Thanks for sharing with a friend. And please enjoy this one with Dr. Jessica Thompson. 
Hello, hello. How's it going, Dr. Jessica Thompson? How are you doing today? I'm very well, thanks. How are you doing, Brian? Well, I am great. I'm great because we're talking. We're talking to you, who, and you're going to be in our film, the six part series now. Food Lies has turned into a six part series. I hope everyone's heard that. But I've been talking to Jessica for a few weeks about recording with her when she gets back from her field research, I guess you'd call it. Is that is that what you're doing? You're going back to Africa? Yeah, that's absolutely what I'm doing. I try to get there every year if I can. But of course, with the pandemic, things have been bottlenecked. And now we have a lot of catching up to do. So I'll be doing that all summer. Great. Well, tell us more about what you do. Where, where are you now? Are you on campus? I am on campus. You can see I have books behind me and, um, you know, not the, the sort of impromptu home office that I've been living in for the last two years. And it's, it's nice to be back on campus again, doing things and just kind of feeling the vibe around here, seeing students walking around. Um, not so many masks either. It's, it's, it feels sort of um, shockingly normal, to be honest. And mm, it's nice. That's great. That's great. And that's Yale. Yeah, that's right. I'm here in the Department of Anthropology at Yale University. Awesome. So tell us more about your specialty, which I think is a broad approach. <laughs> yeah, I, I mentioned that earlier. I, I think maybe that's even a good metaphor for this particular program, because I would consider myself a, a research omnivore. I'm really very interested in lots of different things, but anything that has to do with paleo, in other words, anything that has to do with our understanding of the past, be it uh, human, animal, or otherwise, I'm very interested in that. And I've done research at a number of different time points in the human past, starting at about three and a half million years ago and taking us all the way to the present. So I have particular expertise in some time periods, and then I have a, a very broad view kind of approach, which is also the one I teach, um, which is, I, I suppose, everything else. Oh, yeah. So what? Yeah. So you, you're lecturing still while you're doing your research. And what? Yeah. What do you what are some of your classes or what are some of these points that you teach? Yeah, they're all sort of human origins related. So I have a first year seminar, which is called Understanding Human Origins, where we try to focus on what it is that we we can reasonably know about the past and what the limitations are on that. And maybe what some of the potential is for understanding more about it using some of the, the newer techniques that are just starting to come online. And then I have another class, which is an upper level class, and it's a, it's a science credit, and it's just human evolution. So we cover the human evolutionary record. I'm a paleoanthropologist, so I'm, I'm interested in human evolution, of course, but I also, in practice, do archaeology. So my, my actual um, method is very archaeology-centered, and the way that that connects with human evolution and human origins is that archaeology is what gives us the behavior side of what it is that humans did long ago. So if we want to know something about what humans ate, for example, we have to look at the archaeological record to be able to tie the environments that we know existed to the actual human behavior. So that tells us, you know, what it was they were hunting, for example, what kind of tools they used to do it. So that's where the archaeology comes in, and that's what I do. I also teach uh, an introductory human, um, well, it's an introduction to biological anthropology. And I've got one, which is a graduate seminar, which I call the evolution of human diets. Mm. Well, this is all interesting to us, everyone, me, the listeners, we're going to cover everything. I hope I want to <laughs> cover from where we began. I like that 3.5 million years ago. That's the date Dr. Bill Schindler uses. I know you know him or of him, at least what you use his show in your, you. yeah, the, People know, I, I mean, I've interviewed Bill a bunch of times, but he did, what was his show called? Wasn't that The Great Human Race? The Great Human Race, and he lived through different periods with his co-hosts. And I mean, it was a show. You know, he did the best he could. It's. I think you, you helped critique, oh, what, you know, how did this differ from what w we actually did, right? It's like, we can't recreate everything, but they did their best. Yeah, they sure did. And that's actually why I assign it is because I want students to watch something like that because it's fun to watch and then kind of take what they've learned in the class and um, and apply a critical eye themselves to what it is that, again, kind of coming up against the limitations of what we can actually feasibly think we know about the past. And then how capable are we as modern people today with modern brains and modern bodies and modern technology 
how capable are we of actually reconstructing that that moment in time? Um, given the fact that the you know the organisms we're trying to understand are no longer alive, and many of the environments where they lived are also extinct. It's super hard. It's super hard to piece together. And well, I'm wearing Bill's shirt, "Eat Like a Human," so you see that. <laughs> So that's, we kind of talked about this before we got on air is my approach is, well, yeah, what, what does eating like a human mean? And what does that mean in a modern day? Yeah, we're how do we understand our health and our diet now? We need to look at the past. And that's what I try to do with Sapien. And my idea is a broad approach that's not just, you know, there could be any number of, of trends over the years. I, I just told you it was like paleo, then keto, then carnivore. It's like, I'm not going to follow, I'm going to learn about them. And I'm going to, you know, interview people about them, but we're, I'm not saying there is one approach to it. And I was like, what can we learn? And you know, what is this dietary pattern, this framework that that is human diet and nutrition? So we'll kind of get into that as we go. But I, I want to just start from the beginning, though, like more than just diet. You know, how did we become human? You know, what happened 3.5 million years ago and why is that sort of a line in the sand? Yeah, I mean, everybody who studies a different time period is going to have their own special moment, which they want to um, consider as that sort of line um, before and after we, we were on our way to being human or we were human or we were not. And I think most experts would agree that there isn't really ever a clear line, but that there are these sort of threshold periods of time where major changes seem to have occurred. And those are particularly interesting because they almost certainly had something to do with what our ancestors were eating. Everybody has to eat. That's true now. That was always the case before. And that's what drives a lot of what animals do, how they interact, how they behave. They got to get the food they need in order to survive. So if we apply that kind of thinking to understanding human evolution, then that kind of gives us a way to think about what it is that we actually need to know in order to be able to reconstruct what happened in the past and what the major drivers would have been in making the major changes that we see. And you asked about the 3.5 million time period. I just, I threw that out there because that's actually probably when the archeological record starts. And being an archeologist, I'm more biased towards my actual direct primary research taking place after that time. And um, when I say the archeological record, what that is, is it's the material culture. So this is the, this is the stuff, this is the objects that some sort of human or human-like creature made and left behind and can actually be realistically recovered by us today. So if, in fact, things like sticks and sharpened sticks and um, leaves and stuff like that preserved well, then they would probably comprise part of the archaeological record even earlier because that was most likely what our ancestors used as tools. But realistically, they don't preserve. So we kind of start with stone tools as mostly when we imagine the archeological record beginning. And that's because rocks preserve well and we can find them. And they were almost certainly deployed in the context of food and eating, um, how it was that they got food, how they processed food, and um, some of the decisions and changes that they made in those decisions over what it was that they were going to incorporate in their diets. So 3.5 million is potentially really significant because you do have the earliest stone tools at about 3.3. So, you know, 3.5 sort of rounding up. Uh, it's a more convenient number, but 3.3 is, is the real moment when we have early stone artifacts. And those seem to have been objects that were made through heavy percussive pounding actions. So you imagine a big rock and you take another big rock and you hit the other rock with the other rock. And it sounds very basic, but if you think about it, there aren't a lot of other animals that actually do that and use rocks in a way to, um, you know, where they actually have to think about the properties of the rocks, which rock is going to break, if it's going to be strong enough to withstand the impact and so on. There's actually some technological knowledge that, that does come in. And we know that some primates in particular will do this, and they always do it in the context of trying to eat something. Um, they are breaking open shellfish or they're cracking open nuts. So when we see these early stone artifacts in, um, in this case in Kenya, and they date to 3.3 million, we might suspect that they were invented as a way of processing foods. And that might mean that there were new kinds of foods that were coming online at that time, um, or at least starting to become incorporated into our ancestors' diets. 
So that's why that's kind of a, an interesting moment, both in terms of uh, the evolution of human diet, but also just because archaeologists can actually have something to study after that time. I know there's going to be some primate people listening to this who will probably say, oh, yes, but they're capuchin monkeys and they actually um, will break open rocks for no apparent reason. That is actually true. Um, so I, I said that it's always done in the context of subsistence. Um, there, there is a group of monkeys that will sometimes just smash rocks and, and no one actually seems to know why. <laughs> but, it sounds like me growing up. Yeah, you know, <laughs> young young boys just smash things, I think. Maybe, maybe it's the male monkeys, who knows? Yeah, well, I have three boys, so I witness this behavior in my household all the time. <laughs> well, great. So yeah, so well, well, what was before that? So be before that, people may know the number was like seven to eight million years ago, we kind of split from the primate line and and so yeah what was our diet like and what was the environment like before that 3.5 million mark yeah so um when we talk about primates what we're really talking about is humans apes monkeys even um these things that live in madagascar lemurs things you wouldn't really think of as being super closely related to humans but we're all primates and there's a little bit of an artificial division that a lot of people make between primates and humans and um you know, the fact is humans are primates. We have evolved from other groups of primates and we kind of, over the course of our evolution have made some pretty significant divergences from the way that other primates do things. And most likely that had something to do with the environments where our ancestors were living. And a lot of the hypotheses about why that happened are kind of environmentally driven. We know that over the course of the last 8 million years, there has been a try, sort of a drying out of most of Africa and, and many other parts of the world too. So areas that were once covered in thick forests or in particular in Africa, rainforests would have been sort of giving way to these more open wooded savannas and then eventually more open grasslands. And that's been something that's been going on globally. So the early apes who were living in Africa, there were some group of them that started to make their way into new environments. And for a long time, there have been hypotheses that are very specific about what those environments would have looked like. But we always have to remember that we're very biased by the kinds of fossils that we find and where we find them. So there are some environments that preserve fossils a lot better than others. And rainforest environments are terrible places to preserve fossils. It's wet, you don't get a lot of um, sediment that is washing down into places where it will bury things quickly and create the opportunities for fossils to form. There's also often a lot of acidity in the soil from the, the tree cover that's dropping leaves. So you wouldn't expect to find a lot of fossils in um, places where there were rainforest environments, unless you have swamps or something like that, some of these unique um, environments. And so the result is we have a really terrible fossil record um, between the period of about 8 million years of, well, really a terrible fossil record prior to about 5 million years ago, um, full stop. And one reason for that could very realistically be simply the lack of appropriate environments for that. And that does kind of, in a way, tell us something about diet, because if we know from genetic data that humans split from chimpanzees in that lineage sometime between 7 and 8 million years ago, and chimpanzees still live in these rainforest environments, we can, in a way, use chimpanzees as sort of a, a stand-in for what that last common ancestor would have been doing and what they would have been eating. We know there's a lot of fruits and things like that, for example. Uh, we can also look at the teeth of some of the fossils when they do start to show up in the record, and we can see that they have adaptations that suggest that the ancestral state was fruit eating. And so that kind of gives us a a hint as to what the the sort of early, if you want to say primitive um, sort of diet would have been like, it would have probably been very chimpanzee-like. And there's a number of different lines of evidence that would support that. And then when we actually start to find hominin fossils, so these are the ones that are in our lineage, they are um, most abundant starting after about 5 million years ago, and, and especially after 3.5 million years ago. And I don't think that's a coincidence because that's when we start to really see this new occupation of environments that are a lot more likely to preserve fossil remains. And and then, so what do we see there? So that's when we had these percussive tools, we could smash open bones, we could get marrow. So like, what did that open up nutrition wise for us? Well, this is my pet hypothesis. I really think that 
it was that really nice fatty bone marrow that that actually was kind of a critical resource for some of these early hominins. And if you think about the way that we have long conceptualized in paleoanthropology, the role of stone artifacts, there's this huge emphasis on what we call flakes. So these are these sharp edged rocks that you, you bang one rock against another one, and then you kind of um, make something that is essentially a stone knife. And if you have the right kind of rock, it can be extremely sharp. And sometimes you can even find these things they're just eroding out of these deposits just like they were made yesterday and they're millions of years old and still sharp and they'll still cut you. So they're very effective cutting tools. And I think what what kind of happened was they, they're they obvious. Uh, you can find them easily. You can spot them. You can also find places that we would call or consider sites where there's like a big bunch of them all all together in one place. And sometimes you can even fit them back together. So in a way, you're reconstructing the behavior of something that was, I don't know, potentially your own ancestor millions of years ago as they sat there and broke this rock and you're putting it back together again, which I'm, I'm sure they would have found very strange. But what it does is it gives us insight into what was going on in their mind as they were undertaking that task. And then the next question is, well, why did they want to break these rocks and what were they doing with them? If the goal was to make a sharp edge, then they must have needed something to cut. And that implies that the ancestor didn't need something to cut. It wasn't relying on some sort of food item that required a sharp edge in order to process it. So there's been a lot of emphasis on these kind of sharp edge stone tools, these flakes. And what I was trying to do is, is draw attention to the fact that percussion itself is a very effective tool, like we see in chimpanzees and um, also in capuchin monkeys. You know, they will break open things to get what's inside. And the rocks themselves don't always present with very obvious modifications when that happens. Um, they don't always look really obviously different from a normal rock the way a flake does. So it's very possible that these have been in use for much longer and just simply overlooked by archaeologists, potentially even for millions of years. That's a huge point. Yeah, we only know what we can see in the record. And well, I want to wait till later to ask you, like, we could find something tomorrow that could change everything. Right. If we just we're just looking at the record. Right. It's like, what, what do we have to look at? And yeah, a percussive rock could be just look like a normal rock. But then what you'd study or and what what people find is on the bones themselves, you can see evidence for these marks of them being broken open. Right. Yeah, that's right. And when you hit something with a rock um, and, and that is a durable thing, like a bone that's likely to preserve the you have the fossil bone, but then you also have the fossil trace on the bone surface, which gives you direct insight into what kind of activity was going on that caused that bone to be broken. And so if you find a, a bone that has long, linear, um, narrow marks, those have typically been associated with cutting activities. If you find a bone that's been kind of obliterated or smashed open and it has a, a notch in it, um, that's a dynamic action that's created that kind of um, modification. And then next to that notch, you're going to see a whole bunch of scratch marks and some of the bone surface that will have actually been sort of exploded off. And that is what we call a percussion mark. And that's very typical of percussion damage. The trouble is that there are a lot of other things that can cause marks that look kind of similar to both of those things. And so if you imagine the, I guess we, we call it the life history of a bone. So it used to be inside a living animal, the animal dies, um, something happens to the animal, its bones get scattered, disarticulated, moved around. You almost never just find a fossil carcass. I, I think this is kind of a misunderstanding a lot of people have about paleontology is that you can reasonably walk up to a, a site and then you'll excavate something that looks like a complete skeleton. What you usually find is just tiny little bits and pieces that have accumulated over some unknown period of time, sometimes tens of thousands of years. And they they tend to preserve because they get buried. So if they get buried by something like a stream that's bringing some, you know, like a slow moving stream and it's bringing down some sand and it buries the bones, that can be from animals that were killed at different points in time over a very long period. So it's very difficult to untangle that and figure out if hominins were busy there uh, making uh, this site by basically butchering up a carcass or if this is kind of more of a natural accumulation. And then some of those natural processes can even leave marks on the bones that look very much like 
stone tool marks. And this has created quite a bit of controversy in my particular field where people are trying to apply all kinds of new methods to try to figure out which is which. Wow. So because the cut marks, I mean, but so is it pretty clear that some things are like, these are definitely cut marks and then some are in question, you know, how does it work? So this is, um, this is an issue I've been personally involved with for about a decade now. And it's, it's actually a really, um, it's a frustrating question. It's a frustrating problem because I wish we could say definitely yes. And I think for a long time, we thought that there was a very clear way to identify these things, that there were some that were ambiguous, but that there were also some that you just really could never mistake for anything else. And you have to kind of make that what we call an inferential link between what it is that you're seeing on the fossil in front of you and how it is that you think that came about. And there's this process of doing that that we call middle range theory. So this is kind of where you, you basically do some sort of action in the present day. And then you have a look to see what the resulting trace is of that action. And then if the trace looks similar to the thing you've seen in the past, then you can you have that theory now to support that that's the kind of thing that causes that kind of mark. So the analogy people often use is if you're wandering through the woods and you see a you know some sort of footprint and you've never seen uh, any specific kind of animal make the footprint, then it you know you can make some assumptions about the kind of animal that it was. But if you actually watch an animal making a footprint and then go check the footprint and you see that it has a specific shape, that kind of gives you a much stronger way of knowing with confidence that the next time you encounter it without seeing the animal doing it, you're still looking at the same phenomenon. That's the exact thing that we, we have to deal with, but in the past, and it's almost like reconstructing a murder scene in a way, you know, you have all these pieces of evidence that are, that are in front of you and, and no eyewitnesses. And you have to do the best you can to link what you're seeing to what it is that caused that. Um, and at the same time, be careful to not overinterpret. Um, and, you know, this has become a really sensitive issue because there are sites where you have hundreds and hundreds, thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of bones with these cut marks and percussion marks all over them and lots of other um, information about humans that were there. And then it's not ambiguous. Nobody is going to argue with you that those are cut marks. Mm -hmm. But when you're dealing with these sites, they're right at the kind of cusp of when this behavior might have started to, to begin. And you also have a very poorly researched record because you have people really not looking for this kind of thing that early in time. Now you have a sample size of like maybe five, six, seven bones. And on those bones are just a couple of marks. And, and then it becomes really difficult to be able to argue that just those two specific um, marks you're looking at have some sort of great significance. So what we really have to do to answer that question definitively is just do a lot more research at that time period and figure out if this is a common pattern or if some of these marks that have been claimed to be early cut marks are in fact um, just kind of a fluke from something else. Interesting. So when did the cut marks and the, the sharp blades start coming about compared to the percussion stuff you're talking about 3.3 million years ago? We would, we would like to know because the one that I mentioned at 3.3 is actually the production of flakes, but they're flakes that are really quite different from the kind of flakes that you see later in the record. It's, and there's this really weird long gap too. So there's the, the assemblage at 3.3 million in Kenya. And then the very next oldest collection of flakes is 2.6 million years old, and that's in Ethiopia. So what's going on in that huge intervening time period is really totally unknown at, at this moment. <laughs> Archaeologists have not really looked in that time period because they never expected to find anything. And so gap filling is, is kind of crucial to being able to answer that question. What seems to have happened is that the technology changes pretty substantially between 3.3 and 2.6. There's at the 3.3 site, there's big chunky rocks and um, it looks like essentially they were broken the way a chimpanzee breaks a breaks a rock accidentally when they're cracking nuts so it looks like a big overhanded kind of blow it comes down hard on the rock um, and and then it, it breaks and smashes but the difference is it's intentional and the intent seems to be making these really huge flakes that could also be used for cutting so it's like this weird combination of cutting and, and percussion and then later in time what seems to have happened is that hominins, our ancestors, developed 
this idea that, oh, okay, if I hit one rock with another rock, I'm going to make a sharp edge. And then I intentionally want to do that in an efficient way. So over that time where we have no data, there's all of these really interesting changes that clearly took place in the brains of these hominids. Because by the time you see these early collections at 2.6 million, they're smaller, um, they're being held in the hand, and they're being intentionally hit with a rock being held in the other hand, which is really different from this big, clumsy, overhanded kind of approach. And there's lots of multiple flakes being taken off from the same rock, apparently with the intent of creating um, both a flake and um, you know, the resulting core on the other end of it that, that can both be used as tools. And these hominids are also carefully selecting the exact right kinds of rocks that have the right material properties to break this way. And so they've, they've been learning in that intervening time where we have no data. They've, they've definitely been learning how to do this better. That's so cool. I want to talk about, well, first, I want to tell everyone about your presentation, Fat of the Land. Uh, you can look it up on YouTube. I'll put in the show notes, but it's it's great that you, I don't know when or where you did that, but it kind of covers a lot of this stuff and your, some of your research. But what is your idea of like the timeline of like what came first? So we actually had a call a couple of weeks ago about, you know, food lies and whatnot. And we're talking about there's something must have caused us to become smarter. Like what, yeah, what were these things that happened first? Cause it's a, maybe people have the wrong idea of the timeline. Yeah, great question. Um, and thanks for the plug about the YouTube thing. That was a funny thing because I did this presentation for the Institute of Human Origins in 2018 in New York. And then it just sort of silently existed on YouTube for a while. And then someone found it and someone else found it. And the next thing I know is getting all these emails from people who wanted to know about bone marrow and fat. And, and it clearly had hit some sort of trigger out there in broader society, this interest in uh, what it is that we can learn about the past and how that can inform us about what our ancestors ate. And it is definitely related to um, the evolution of larger brains. And, um, you know, it's not so tenuous to then say, well, yeah, we've gotten a lot smarter over the years. Um, it's not that there's a perfect correlation between brain size and intelligence and measuring intelligence is a notoriously hard thing to do. But um, we have a really much bigger brain than other animals in comparison to our body size. We have sort of excess computing power. And the thing about our brains is it takes up about 20% of our resting metabolic energy. And yet this, this is an organ that weighs only about 2% of the entire weight or mass of our body. So why we would have such an expensive organ and how such an expensive organ would have evolved is a real puzzle. And um, it's, it kind of comes back to food because essentially you've got to feed that thing. You've got to fuel it. How do you best supply your brain with energy? Not necessarily just on the sort of your day-to-day -day activities, but over time, how do you evolve a creature that has a large, oversized, expensive brain that is um, presumably needing to use that brain in order to survive. So there must have been enormous selective pressure on intelligence and becoming more and more big brained over time. But how to afford that in terms of the calories that we would need in order to be able to feed that brain is, is kind of how we can link food to to that question of the evolution of brain size. We know it had to be some sort of shift in diet because then um, if having a big brain is so advantageous, you would have to ask, well, why isn't this more common? And it's, it's because it's expensive to maintain it. So um, that's where we see the kind of link with diet. And that's what I think is kind of the transformative moment in hominin evolution, in my view, is when we began to incorporate more calorie dense foods into our diets in a way that we could get them reliably and in these packages that were really, um, as I said, calorie dense. So, you know, a horse is out there grazing. It's not got a calorie dense diet. It's eating grass. It has to sit there and ferment it in its stomach. Um, it's not a ruminant, so it doesn't sort of, you know, burp it back up and rechew it. And, and it's not a very efficient eater, but they have small brains compared to their body size. And that's, that's typical of um, honestly most herbivores. And where you see brain size being a bit larger within groups of any organism, whether you're looking at something like um, mammals or, or fish even, the bigger brained taxa are the ones that are more social often, um, or they're the ones that have sort of diets that, that tend to be more 
demanding or extractive for them to have to get something out of it. And apes are particularly big brained primates and humans are particularly big brained apes. So when we started out, we already had a little bit of an advantage, but there's something different in the early hominin diet when we start to see an increase in brain size, there's got to be something different that they're eating in order to be able to feed that brain. And it could just be a different type of food. It could be a more effective way of, of extracting calories out of the same food that they were already eating. Could be a more effective way of getting that food in the first place, maybe a social mechanism there. But there's something going on with food when you see the bigger brain. And the very first time you see that brain size increase is around three and a half million years ago. So. So what was that food source? I mean, bone marrow, <laughs> fat, you know, we're, yeah, we're, we're, we're going around it. We're also kind of skirting around the expensive tissue hypothesis. I, you know, famous Aiello and Wheeler. And actually I've been, I've been emailed Leslie Aiello and she's out of the game. I was trying to get her in the film and she politely declined and says she's out of academia. But yeah, why don't you just tell us a little more about, yeah, what went on back then? Well, when most people think of that 3.5 million, they're not, um, that's, that's a little bit of a controversial number in a sense, because um, really the big brain size increase comes with um, hominin species that we see after about 1.8 million years ago. That's, that's something that is not um, controversial at all. Um, there mm. has been a, a big brain size increase by 1.8 million. And again, we have this frustrating gap um, in information that we have between the period of about, you know, 2.6 and 1.8, there's just not a lot of data in that period of time. And, um, you know, the, the kind of the emergence of our genus Homo is, is itself an extremely murky issue with a poorly resolved fossil record. And um, part of that problem seems to just be this, this problem of preservation. There just aren't fossil deposits that date to the critical time periods and the places that we would like to see them. They're there, but they're not, um, they're just not as common as, as other fossil deposits. So we end up with this kind of problem where we don't know a lot about the periods of time when we know the brain size increase really started to, to ramp up. But the 3.5 million um, time period is when you actually have Australopithecus. And Australopithecus may or may not have emerged from a uh, taxon called Artipithecus. That's the, the best known earlier hominin. And that dates to about 4.2 million. And it had a small brain. So um, given the kind of poor resolution of the fossil record, who knows? There might have been a bigger brained ape around somewhere in that time, but it wasn't Artipithecus. And by the time you get to Australopithecus, um, around kind of 3.8 to 3.5, the brain size is starting to get bigger a little bit. And even a small brain size increase is meaningful. So this is where I think we have evidence for Australopithecus being the first hominin that's really venturing out into these more open environments. You can see that through where we find the fossils, the environments around them, the, the kinds of animals that are in the same fossil deposits. They're from more open habitats than you would see with Artipithecus. Artipithecus seemed to have lived in a more closed woodland and Artipithecus was also eating more closed woodland kinds of, um, of things like fruits. We might imagine fruits, a more chimpanzee-like diet. We know that because the chemical evidence we get from their teeth preserves a signature of if you're eating an open or a closed habitat um, sort of diet. Now, that's pretty broad, right? So you don't know what is living in the open habitats or the closed habitats. But um, what you do know is that the availability of these large mammals that you could get something like bone marrow and brain from they're just going to be more common out in the more open habitats there's going to be a lot more herding ungulates and there's going to be these periods when you know they're they're sort of mass die-offs because they're trying to cross a river i think we've all seen those documentaries when there are many many wildebeest deaths and those kinds of events are going to just be more common when you're the kind of organisms that can go out and exploit open habitats now, some people have argued there's other things you can also get in open habitats that don't preserve very well at all in the fossil record. And that's things like tubers. So your underground storage organs, think of think of like a potato, but, you know, a very wild, stringy kind of nasty mm -hmm. potato. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and there's this huge diversity of these sort of root, um, you know, 
root resources that are available out on um, open habitats. And so some people have argued it's starches that was actually the catalyst and that starches were producing the extra glucose we needed in order to fuel our brains. Sounds like a vegan documentary. <laughs> no, I, no, I've heard that. No, actually, I've eaten one of those with the Hudza. Um, yeah, you baked it by the fire and it was like very stringy and there was like nothing. Yeah, I basically just chewed on a bunch of fiber stuff and then they just spit out all the fiber. But I guess I did get a little bit of glucose out of it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a kind of a back and forth um, discussion. I wouldn't say it's a huge argument. You know, it's not like it's root people versus meat people. But, um, you know, what we what we see is it's definitely a bias towards looking at the the animal fossil record because it actually produces a fossil record and the plant resources don't really do that. But if you kind of try to step back and look at where it is that modern hunter gatherers place a lot of the value, you know, the social value and also the caloric value, um, they tend to get it mostly from either large animals or honey, as you would have experienced with the Hadza. I so did. You know, these are the kinds of things that you can find out in open habitats in quantities that you just simply can't really do when you're living in um, inside a tropical rainforest. So, um, you know, this this kind of open habitat exploitation, I think, was was what opened the door to the ability to find lots and lots of uh, new new opportunities to get at bone marrow that you couldn't have before. Oh, and yeah. Yeah, that's that's fat right there. That's a big fat package for you. Well, it's great. And it's well preserved. And you talk about this in the presentation. And I'm sure your research, it's like a little lunchable. Huh, that's a really bad analogy. But you have a bone that protects it. And then we could come even if the animal was killed days and days ago, weeks ago, you could come in, uh, break open the bones and get the marrow, break open the brains or the skull and get the brains. Yeah, that's right. And and you only need a simple rock to do that. But we don't see chimpanzees doing that. We see them using the same kind of technology. They obviously are smart enough to do it because they crack open nuts, but they're not living in the habitats where they're finding regularly these kinds of large animal carcasses. So my view is that you have this new intersection between kind of a, an applied technology that was already in use, this nut cracking technology. And then some smart hominin said, Let's try to break open this bone and see what's inside. And and that allowed a lot of um, sort of new calories to flow through the group. And, and that's a that's the kind of behavior that's going to take off very, very quickly. Unlike um, biological adaptation, these kinds of technological adaptations can, you know, they can change the whole dietary profile of a group within a generation. You don't have to wait around for evolution to catch up biologically. You You can just if you if you invent a new way of processing food or or finding food or a new kind of food that you can get through some sort of behavioral mechanism, then you can really change behavior very fast. Well, that's what we saw with our guts, too. That's kind of gut expensive tissue hypothesis and why our guts changed in relation to our brain. So our guts got smaller, our brain got bigger, even the different parts of our gut where we extract more bioavailable nutrient dense nutrition. And so our guts changed. We didn't have to have these large, large intestines to ferment plant matter. We, we, our small intestines got bigger in comparison because we had a rich source of nutrients and fat basically is one of the main things, not necessarily meat. I like to, you talk about the difference between meat and fat and, and how those are different. Yeah. Well, I mean, most wild game is not very fatty. And anyone who's who's eaten wild game knows that you have to get into the brains and you have to get into the marrow and around the organs. And another thing is that they change in their fat content pretty substantially seasonally. So what you find is is actually wildlife ecologists. I don't know if they still do this, but in the sort of in the 1980s, when archaeologists started paying attention to this, wildlife ecologists were using bone marrow as a measure for animal health. So if they find a dead animal, you break it open, you look at the marrow. If it's fat, um, it's going, if it's full of fat, it's going to be kind of a yellowish uh, white. It's going to be firm and, and squishy. And um, if it's the animal is in good health, that means it had a lot of fat reserves because that's what ungulates do. So these are your hoofed animals. They store their fat and their energy reserves inside their bone marrow. And when they deplete them, the bone marrow becomes runny and kind of pink and and red and it's mostly just these kind of blood cells 
And so you can actually just see if the animal was in good nutrition or poor nutrition based on its bone marrow. It's a very easy, um, intense sort of taste and olfactory um, cue there that early hominins would have been able to pick on, pick up on immediately. So, you know, this is a, a thing that that is very, very clearly a, um, an exploitable resource that's easy to get into if you just know how. And I think that's kind of what happened was just a real, a real quick shift in the knowledge uh, that it was there, that it was edible, that it was, that it was satisfying, tasty. Um, you know, it would have hit all of those buttons. And, and our bodies adapted very quickly. Maybe I know it's not your area of expertise, but I mean, maybe just elaborate a little bit more on the changes that happened when we got access to more fat. So I'm not sure that we necessarily needed to adapt to digest it. It's pretty digestible and chimpanzees and, and um, even baboons, you know, they'll, they'll take a dead animal and if they can break the bone open with their teeth just by chewing on it, they suck the marrow out. So they, they, it's clearly a desirable resource that is digestible by other primates. But the, um, I think the difference in what that allowed us to do in the very long evolutionary picture is it provided a potentially more seasonal, um, but, but certainly um, commonly available resource that was nutrient dense without having to necessarily become an accomplished hunter. Because um, a lot of the sort of early debates in my field about, well, were they hunting these animals or were they scavenging from them? It doesn't actually really matter that much at this early time period, because either way, having access to that bone marrow is going to be extremely useful. If you're just eating lean meat, that isn't actually providing you with a ton of calories. Um, I think this is the premise of a lot of these, <laughs> these sort of very lean meat heavy diets is if you don't want to eat a ton of calories, you, you, you know, you want to kind of avoid the fattier parts of the animal. And that's certainly going to create problems uh, with protein toxicity if that's all you're eating all the time. And we see this in these kind of early explorer accounts of rabbit starvation, where they're just eating all these rabbits and they're eating, 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 and they're starving, 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 and they can't figure out how this is happening. So, you know, you have to have fat in your diet um, and or starch um, in, a, in a balance. And when you do that, you're, you're really just able to kind of unlock the ability to free the, the, the previously existing constraints on how big your brain can get, in other words. So you have extra energy now. And it's not to say that you're inevitably going to evolve a big brain because you have extra energy. That's actually something I see in some of the comments on my YouTube videos, like, well, why doesn't everything that's a carnivore have a big brain? Um, well, I think that there has to be some sort of reason to evolve a big brain. And there also has to be these chance genetic mutations that have to happen, not necessarily under the control of the organism. And you put those things together with enough energy flow and now you've released the constraint that would otherwise have been there. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is um, that you can't grow a big brain if you don't have extra energy. If you do have extra energy, it's not inevitable that you will. Yeah. There could be other things there, but but it, it means that it's possible. It's now possible. And a lot of people talk about the social aspect, collaboration, communication, hunting, and stuff like that. How do you see that, that fit into this timeline of like, you're saying, yes, we started having these adaptations and a bigger brain before we started hunting. Well, I mean, the whole hunting um, origins of hunting is still something that's pretty controversial. I mean, there's lots of there's lots of animals that do hunt um, without necessarily um, doing it as their kind of primary food source. Right. So when you think about the problem of hunting, you have to kind of ask, like, how important is this particular food source in the environment and can they get it in another way? And um, the social aspect of hunting varies because some carnivores in particular will hunt solitarily, you know, obviously, and then some of them really rely on these group hunts. I was so lucky recently, I was in Malawi and we were able to see a pack of wild dogs that, I mean, those, they're so cooperative. One of them had actually come and um, I think it was out on its own for some reason and it took out a reed buck and then it actually went and got the rest of the pack you know mm. before before eating that reed buck it went off oh, and got wow. yeah what it a generous little guy very generous 
So there, there are some organisms where this is just, you know, what you do and how you do it. And they're very successful hunters. They have to hunt multiple times a day. Um, and they usually are very successful when they do it. So, um, you know, kind of how important or central this issue of hunting was, I think it's, it's going to be hard to kind of untangle that, especially when you have these ancient environments where there were a lot more big animals around than there are now. So we have hippos and, and rhinos and giraffes and elephants now in the African um, sort of open savanna environments. But in the past, there were lots of other things, too, that are extinct now. And there were the carnivores that ate them. Uh, most people kind of, when they think of, of saber-toothed cats, for example, it's, it's, a, it's a compelling kind of image. But those cats had to have something to eat. And a lot of the megafauna are extinct now. But they would have also been available to early hominins too. So um, the kind of opportunities to scavenge really huge packages of bone marrow that were totally inaccessible to other carnivores is, is much greater in, in the time period that we're talking about between about three and two million years ago, much greater than it would have been after that point when we start to lose a lot of that megafauna. It's a super good point because we kind of try to study modern hunter-gatherers. That's the extreme case where they're pushed off, marginalized in these small areas of land with not many resources, and then trying to draw a bunch of conclusions from that. When there's millions of years that we had access to gigantic megafauna and huge amounts of bone marrow and all kinds of stuff. So it's hard to not just think of you know what we observe now or in the recent history. And the, the modern ethnography is, I feel like it's, it's, I, I draw on it and need it. I rely on it. Um, it's so important and valuable, but, and I don't want to disregard how valuable it is, but it is just so incredibly biasing in the way that we have to think about the environments where hunter gatherers lived and the kinds of resources they would have had. It's, I mean, I, I work now, my work in Malawi is in much later time periods with ancient hunter-gatherers, these would have been fully modern people, but living, you know, in the last 30,000 years or so. And in those environments, we don't, we don't actually have a single hunter-gatherer group that, that has ever been observed living in those environments. And it's a totally different kind of environment from the one that you would see, for example, where the Hadza live. So applying what we learn from the Khoisan or the Hadza into totally different kinds of environments is a really problematic thing to do at some level. I mean, you can you can use some of the general principles and sort of boil down some of the general principles, the how people, you know, how many calories people need. Obviously, that's not going to vary, for example. But, um, you know, how it is they would have been able to acquire resources in the amount of time they had to forage is going to be really different between environments. And so I think that the, the point you make is, is so important. Even the modern hunter-gatherers that are available to kind of work with and try to understand they're living in places where even their ancestors would have been probably not really wanting to live compared to some of the places that they used to live. So it's a very, very biased sort of, um, sort of record. Well, it is. And, they, and all the big animals are in the game reserves and quarantined off where tourists pay to see them and stuff like that. So yeah, it's totally different. So yeah, so there's the megafauna. We had access to them. Do you have strong opinions about when and why they died off? Uh, it varies per per continent, I suppose. It's going to vary by region, but the, you know, given the resolution of the fossil record, it's hard to answer that question definitively um, until you kind of zoom out and look at the whole continent. And this is a huge debate too that various colleagues of mine have weighed in on. And and for the most part, they don't, they don't have their analyses are pretty convincing to me that humans didn't have a lot to do with the extinction of, of megafauna or even hominins um, earlier in time in Africa. But when you start moving to other continents, it becomes a lot less certain because with the expansion of modern humans out of Africa, so first we evolved on the African continent and there were you know various species of hominins. There would have been Homo erectus, then after Homo erectus, or maybe even during the same time as Homo erectus, there would have been some other things that are, you know, they have long unpronounceable names, but, you know, mm -hmm. Homo heidelbergensis is one that, that people talk about. Mm -hmm. um, there's now some discussion about why we need to replace that with a different term. Anyway, without getting tangled mm -hmm. up in, in the taxonomy, there was Homo erectus, there were some intermediate forms with bigger brains, um, and then there's modern humans. And they may have been living not necessarily one evolving into the next, but actually living 
all around the same time as each other with some overlap in different regions as various subpopulations evolved and changed. So you might have had some remnant um, of these kind of intermediate forms living at the same time as modern humans, for example. But um, when, the, when, when hominins moved out of Africa, the first wave was kind of represented by Homo erectus, which was this um, large brain hominin. It's the first time when you really definitively see a larger brain. And yet, um, if you really want to get into the nuances of the record, when you see the very earliest Homo erectus outside of Africa, there are some individuals there that had pretty small brains. There's, there's actually a lot of variation in brain mm. size. So this is this population, um, potential population at uh, Dominici, which is a site in, in Georgia. And, you know, this is the country of Georgia, not the, not the state. <laughs> not Atlanta. All right. <laughs> um, but, you know, they have a lot of variation in brain size there. I think they have six, uh, six skulls. And that's kind of a big number to have from a single locality. And they date to 1.8 million years ago. There's huge variation. It's almost like a big evolutionary experiment was, was captured in the fossil record. And we don't know necessarily what happened to that bunch, but um, you know, hominins then did spread all the way across Eurasia, and uh, you know, they they evolved into various other forms that we know of as Neanderthals, and some people may have heard of Denisovans, for example, um, only really known from the DNA. Then, while all of this was going on in Europe and Asia, there were similar processes happening on the continent of Africa, and the the hominin that that really made the big splash um, upon departure from Africa was us, that was modern humans. And that exit probably took place between 80 and 60,000 years ago, the last sort of wave of modern humans. With that wave, you see a lot of extinction of megafauna wherever they go. So although there are people who argue that humans were not directly responsible, um, some that argue they were, and some that argue everything in between, for each and every continent, kind of the, the evidence in my mind increases that humans were directly responsible for the extinction of things like mammoths and mastodons in continents like the Americas and um, for these giant wombats and things that they had in Australia also. Um, a little bit less sure about the responsibility hominins might have had in Africa. And part of that is this what they call the co-evolution hypothesis, this idea that when you're co-evolving in a community of organisms, you know which ones to watch out for. You know which ones are going to hunt you and which ones are going to be dangerous. And so you see that a, a number of ungulates, they, they develop these flight distances. And what they are are kind of like they, they have a look at a threat, a potential threat. And then they have a response of how far it is that they're going to run away from that threat. And then when they do that, it's, it's kind of calibrated as to what kind of predator it is that they think they're seeing. Interesting. So, you know, if it's a if it's a running predator that can go very fast like a cheetah, that will the flight distance will be further. Um, you know, if it's something else that they think isn't going to be able to run uh, very fast, then they won't they won't run away as far. Now with humans, we kind of a wild card because we can we can kill something without even being close to it. And so that technology of evolving the technology to kill from a distance was probably a, a bit of a game changer for a lot of other species in all of the various places where, where humans were. But um, that kind of co-evolution over many millions of years of Homo erectus and then these other forms within the continent of Africa alongside the megafauna, maybe that was one reason why you don't see this dramatic sort of extinction associated with, with you know, with hominin evolution. Hmm. And so the, the big animal, so not only is a bigger animal, a bigger ROI for our time, more fat, but it also, they have more fat per their weight, right? They have a more percentage of fat, like a rabbit, a, these small animals don't have much fat at all. They're like mostly protein. Yeah. Generally speaking, they do. Um, of course, taking into account these variations, these seasonal variations in kind of animal health, because that can vary a lot. I, I can't remember the numbers, but I could find them. Um, but the the actual percentage of an animal, a wild ungulate's body fat, especially that amount that's stored in the marrow, is is a big, big difference um, mm, depending on if it's in good health or not. When the season, yeah, when they have enough food and they fatten up. And I, I'm pretty sure humans preferentially choose those, right? I know, I think you even mentioned it, the eland, the, you know, cave drawings of like these big fat elands. 
Yeah, the eland is a very, ex, it's sort of an extra fat, fatty antelope. It has this um, sort of funny dewlap that hangs down below its neck and um, that's got a bit of fat in it, but also just in general, its organs are fattier. It honestly, um, it, it's like how we can tell the difference between a high quality cut of steak <laughs> and one that isn't. It's usually fat content mm -hmm. that is dictating that. And um, so there's a very um, precise sort of taste um, that we have. And, and what I guess I'm trying to say is it would be very easy for somebody, an early hominin to pick up on that difference. Yeah, and then do we have, I'm pretty sure I remember studies that we preferentially hunt these bigger ones or or is that our wait to to hunt them or harvest them at a certain time when they are fatter? Well, what you see in the kind of over many, many thousands of years kind of view is that a lot more small game comes into the diet later in time. And this happens pretty much everywhere. Um, so these early hominin sites where there is evidence of cut marks on bones, the ones where people aren't fighting about whether the cut marks are not, um, you know, they, they tend to be on larger animals. There hasn't been a huge emphasis on trying to look for smaller animals, but even just at archaeological sites themselves um, that, are, that are earlier in time, there are few small bodied animals, you know, in the kind of rabbit size range. And they're there. It's not like they would have ignored them. You know, you, if it moves, eat it. <laughs> that would have been a, a fairly standard rule, I imagine. But you you just see kind of a, there is a little bit of a preference towards animals that are sort of goat size and bigger. But there is a nuance to it too, because at these very early sites, like the ones about 1.8 million years ago or 2 million years ago, it looks like there might be some evidence that they were able to hunt animals that were in that body size range, but scavenge from animals that were bigger. Mm. So it's not like, you know, once you become an accomplished hunter, you, you can just go kill anything. But um, more to the point that there are certain kind of ranges of body size animals that you would have been able to exploit through hunting and then others you would have kind of had to have relied more on scavenging. But remember, scavenging doesn't necessarily mean that you, it's like an old rotten thing that you find. I mean, you you can use cues like you watch the vulture circle, you know something has died. You go to that place, you have a look around. If there's enough of you and you've got big sticks and rocks, you can chase off a carnivore and you can take a kill from them. And that's a really effective strategy. So scavenging doesn't have to mean passively, weakly um, eating rotten stuff. You could have pretty early access if you were a... Um, a smart scavenger, a smart social scavenger. Well, it sounds like we were. And yeah, why not we exploit all the things we can? It's like, yeah, we could be great hunters. And then, well, yeah, there's this giant mammoth that's just sitting there. Let's get some of that bone marrow. So yeah. well, also there, there's smaller animals later. Isn't that just because that's all that was available? Like once the megafauna went extinct? Well, with the extinction of megafauna, you still have animals that are kind of in the body range of, uh, you know, an elk or a moose. That's actually still considered megafauna, believe it or not. Anything that's, that's larger than 100 pounds is megafauna. Mm. We're megafauna. Mm, <laughs> Humans are <wow>. megafauna. <laughs> I know. And it's a funny thing. I, um, you know, I, I have a, a megafauna expert in my lab at the moment. And he's, um, he's always kind of having to remind me about how the definition of megafauna isn't what um, not just people in the public perceive, but a lot of researchers kind of have this idea that it was something really, truly huge. Um, a lot of the really, really enormous megafauna went extinct, but that still left behind a lot of these large bodied ungulates that would have been, um, you know, very, very important staples in the diet of many hominins. You see a lot of reindeer, for example, at sites in kind of Ice Age Europe. They seem to have been exploited. Reindeer, bison and so on were apparently preferred food of Neanderthals. They were also eating mammoths and mammoths were still around then. Um, but they were eating a lot of these other kinds of animals too. And when mammoths went extinct, it's not necessarily the case that, um, you know, Neanderthals went extinct because mammoths weren't there. It's a very unclear extinction chronology and may not have any relationship to the other one at all because there were lots of other large bodied mammals around, just not extra large um, bodied mammals. When you start to see these little tiny things like rabbits, um, 
being intensively exploited is actually really around 20,000 years ago plus. And it's a worldwide phenomenon. A lot more fish and a lot more of these small bodied animals. And some of them may have been uh, communal hunts like net hunts. That depends on kind of the ecology of the animal. Some of them might have been um, technological advances. So like if you have a certain type of fishing, once you inv invent fishing nets, for example, you can get a lot more fish fast than if you're sitting there trying to fish for individual fish. So like the effort that you're putting in versus the amount of calories you can get back, is the whole relationship changes. So there, what you kind of see over time is that around 20,000 years ago, worldwide, there are a lot of hunter-gatherer groups that really start to more intensively be um, taking these small animals. And it might be because of what you're saying. It might be because their preferred larger prey were not as commonly available, even though they were still around, you know, in, in the sort of moose body size range, they, they might not have been as common. And when you see resource depression like that, then then people will switch to something else. And usually it's accompanied by all sorts of changes and kind of the social social ideology that, that is around these things. Um, who should hunt if it's prestigious to hunt them? You know, if it's gendered, if it's by, you know, if kids are allowed to partake, those are all things that are going to be unfortunately invisible to us, but would have been very interesting because when you change the economic base, you also change a lot of the societal norms around who, what you eat, who gets to eat it um, and how you can get it. That's really interesting. Well, I'm also thinking if this was only 20,000 years ago and we're talking about a couple million years, I mean, shouldn't we be taking cues of how the body changed? Like uh, the adaptations on that level of uh, any organism, mammal, whatever, dictates what like what nutrition needs it does best with in a certain sense. So like it seems like way longer we were eating these giant fatty animals or having access to you know, a certain type of food for, you know, a couple million years, depends on what kind of pre-humans we're talking about. So yeah, what what do you think about that? I think that in general, that's probably true that you have to kind of look at the long-term adaptations. Um, my impression is that we're just really at the very beginning of actually understanding the, the complicated ways in which the body processes energy and different kinds of energy in and then actually being able to link that to the kinds of resources that need to go in to the body to get it so what i'm saying is there are some very recent evolutionary adaptations that occurred at the genetic level that um, have been transformative in human societies and i'm sure you've talked about this on the show before with lactase persistence for example mm -hmm. so i mean th that's a genetic change that's that's something that has spread rapidly um, it only requires a mutation in one um, particular part of the genome, and it's happened convergently. So different populations have different genes that have changed in the same way to yeah. produce the same result because it's such an important adaptation. And that's to digest milk sugar beyond infancy. And that is directly related in um, every documentable case to a, a history of dairying or pastoralism or the um, kind of connection with groups that had that kind of technology. So that's a pretty cool example of humans come up with this technological innovation. Um, in other words, the innovation is milking, you know, whatever you're milking, a cow, a camel, a goat, whatever, um, and, and having that milk available. And then some groups of people will actually just kind of process it um, by making it into yogurt and stuff like that. And other groups of people actually biologically adapted um, with changes in their genome. But that's, you know, that's a simple change with a huge impact. And I think what we don't know is how many simple changes with huge impacts there might have been and how many really complex long term changes that relied on millions of years of evolution there might have been. So I guess that's kind of what I mean by I think we're at the cusp of starting to try to understand the relationship between biological evolution via genomes and genetic data. And then the actual nutritional impact that that would have had on our ability to process energy. There's probably going to be a lot of variation in that um, between populations, even recently. And then there's going to be like that shared long term, deep evolutionary history that it's layered on top of. And I think it's going to be hard to pick out which is which. 
It is. Yeah. I mean, there, there's such a long history that, that, yeah, like really dictated like our morphology, like our gut morphology changed. Like, and then we're talking about more recently, it could just be a little DNA switch that allowed us to yeah eat lactose into adulthood or even the amylase genes and, you know, starches. But so that, but yeah, but when we're looking at a big scale, like we know that humans require nutrient dense, like nutrition and I guess we could skip ahead straight to modern day. Um, I like the idea of these mis mismatched genes or mismatched diets. Anything like that is that our human body just hasn't ad adapted fast enough to deal with all these modern foods and modern lifestyles, right? And you're saying that they can start to happen. And that did happen with certain agricultural things, you know, 10 to 20,000 years ago. But now... I don't know if we want to skip ahead to the end already. Uh, we are running out of time a little bit, but now we're, you know, eating Twinkies and Doritos and it's like, oh yeah, this, this is too big a jump. Our bodies are not ready for this and maybe they shouldn't ever be ready for this. It's a really big, really fast jump. I mean, the, the scale on which this has happened, these transformations in processed food has been so, just so phenomenally fast compared to everything else. When we think about a change that happened 5,000 years ago, let's say, with dairying and lactase persistence. Um, you know, 5,000 years ago is a very, very short time in the very long term picture, but a very, very long time when you compare it to like the last 100 years, <laughs> which is when all of these essentially junk foods have come online. And I, you know, I said I wasn't going to take a position in this show, but I will take a position against junk food. <laughs> maybe, maybe this is something um, because I, I have those three kids that I just see how manic people get about the cravings that these things satisfy and just how little they actually seem to be able to supply in terms of long long term useful energy and the the change has happened so fast in terms of our ability to produce these calorie dense foods artificially that i really don't think we've had a chance to catch up and um i don't know if we will catch up but there are some surprisingly fast, small scale genetic changes that can happen over the course of even a couple generations. There was a paper, I think, last year where they went and documented that even in the course of one generation, um, it looks like populations, there was selection against uh, smoking, <laughs> essentially people who were smokers. Um, just there, there was a there was an actual discernible genetic um, difference between one generation and the next in genes that are associated with susceptibility to problems that are exacerbated by by smoking. So if that can happen in one generation, you know, maybe there's going to be some subtle changes um, in our lifetime, <laughs> but they're going to still require many, many, many thousands of years of evolution for us to adjust in any meaningful way. And even then, I'm not sure they're going to be that meaningful because as as we've kind of talked about, all of this is overlaying on top of the very long millions of year scale nutritional requirements that we have evolved. And that is to have a diverse diet that is certainly um, calorie dense enough to feed the brain, but but also not, um, you know, not out of sync with what it was that was that, that our ancestors could have realistically actually had access to on a day to day basis. And that's going to be a very, I, I would predict that would be a very long term thing to try to change. And you might have some superficial changes like, you know, I mentioned the, you know, the lactase persistence, for example, one small change can have a big impact, but that's still only in one food uh, and one type of food. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that all of the other nutritional requirements and the basic um, composition that you need in your diet of the macronutrients, right? You've got to have your proteins, you've got to have your fats, and you've got to have your your um, carbohydrates. And those are unchanged by things like lactase persistence. People still need all of those things. So it's just a, a small genetic tweak that gives you access, you know, to something that you didn't have before. But at, at the end of the day, you still need all of those components. And that's a, that's a long-term evolved um, state that we're in. So yeah, I, I, I think maybe I'm just going around myself at this point. But but I think what you've got is you've got layers of, of influence and you, you you would not expect us to be able to cope with these kinds of very fast dietary changes at any kind of meaningful scale in um you know in a short term. 
Well, I just thought of it. Well, we are we are kind of adapting in a way. We're adapting to become obese and have type two diabetes, or you know what I mean. It's like our body is in a bad way. It's, it's like I don't know what you just gave me. You gave me a whole bunch of weird, highly processed foods that don't have all the nutrients that I'm used to, and so to not die, I'm going to start building body fat or visceral fat around my organs, or you know, have blood sugar problems and insulin problems, and we're we're trying to stay alive. So it's interesting that in the short term. We have the food has become so bad and so so low in nutrients that we have adapted. It's just these adaptations are killing us. Well, you know, there's this is kind of a nuance that I try to have my students figure out, which is the difference between long term evolutionary adaptation and short term um, biological acclimatization. So it's like, you know, you, you climb a high mountain, right? And you and you produce more red blood cells. And that allows you to carry oxygen more efficiently. And that's a short term acclimatization. So you, you can you can cope with the new conditions. You know, there's a stressor. It produces a response. The response doesn't always have a positive effect on the organism, though, because like as you said, it's a, it's a way to try to keep it alive in the moment. And that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, if you were to stay at the high elevation, you would actually not start to struggle with other things that we know people who live even. Uh, people who have lived for many generations at high elevations will struggle with like low birth weight, for example. So it's not that um, you, human bodies are wonderfully flexible in their ability to acclimatize. But um, but the adaptation thing, I mean, that takes that takes change at the genetic level and that takes change over many generations in most cases. So I, I would kind of just to tease out some of the nuance of the terminology there, I think that, yeah, we're, we're, we're able to acclimatize to some of these new conditions, but it's not necessarily um, in our best interest to do so. <laughs> and um, just because we're able to sort of cope with it enough to stay alive doesn't mean that it's, it's in a healthy way. And then at the same time, we still have um, the, the potential to adapt over the very, very long term in ways that are more substantive. It's a great point. And I, yeah, I shouldn't even call it adapt. You need that terminology and you have the correct terminology. We're not adapting. We're just acclimatizing ourselves. And it's, yeah, I think it's super bad. It seems like most people these days just kind of in the mainstream who don't really think about it, they're just like, how do they're, they're just trying to survive? You know what I mean? They're just kind of like going along and it, they're, they're not thinking about this and it, you can survive just eating anything, really. Yeah, you're getting enough calories, right, to stay alive, but you're seeing all the ill effects of it. And there's just a few people. I, I mean, my goal is to find these few people, get more people interested in not just surviving and figuring out what what the human their body needs, right? It could be any number of of diets, and not just try to survive and not just try to get calories. So I, I do a lot of content on just why counting calories is dumb. I, I get it, you know, I get the energy balance, but calories can keep you alive, but that doesn't mean you're healthy. And I'll, I'll throw it back to you here. Just what, what can, so what can we learn? Like we, we don't know exactly what we ate. We just know we didn't have Doritos and Twinkies, I guess, you know, like what, what like what can we, so we can know a lot. We yeah, can well, kind of know a lot. learned from all of this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, the, I think that it's it's pretty clear that humans have humans have diverged away from other primate lineages in many important ways, and that has resulted in lots of big bodily changes. Our big brains, our upright posture, um, and even the fact that we have these hands that are well adapted to tool use. All of these things are really different from the way that they manifest in other primates. And it's not to say that there's not diversity in other primates. They each have their own set of peculiar adaptations to however um, you know, that journey has been for them. But with humans, we, we just, one way that we really are very different from other primates is we're the only ones that will regularly consume animal products from animals that are bigger than ourselves. And you know, there's always someone who's gonna pipe up and say, oh, you say this is the difference between humans and other primates, and, and, but there's this one monkey, you know, like the ones that make the break, break rocks just for the heck of it. Um, but I mean, when it comes to what we eat, that's a big dietary divergence. Humans really eat a lot of animal food. Um, we have done that since we 
what certainly since 3.5 million years ago and potentially earlier. And I think that that's had a huge impact on our behavior, our biological adaptations in terms of our brain size. It, it may have even been related to our degree of sociality because the way you get food is often a social kind of thing. So, you know, when you think about kind of the context of food and food and human societies and animal societies, that's the thing that drives everything. So if you change that, then you change all of the other things. And I, I think that it was changes in diet and the technology associated with diet change, particularly around animal products that, that kind of made uh, a really big watershed moment in human evolution around starting around 3.5 million years ago and then, and then culminating by 2 million years ago with Homo erectus. That's kind of my personal view of the reading of the literature and the evidence. I'm not saying that I don't think things like starches are important or some people have suggested that fire is very important because that allows you to extract more out of your environment. Um, I think that it, it was a lot more complex than that, but we have to we have to assign some sort of significance to animal products. There's just no way that that wasn't an important part of it. I love that. I, I, and that's just what I'm trying to fight against is I'm not a carnivore, but I, I, I'm trying to just the world is heading towards this vegan route. I don't know if people are just making a lot of money off of fake meat products and or it sounds great um, or they think it's good for the environment which you know is another discussion because you can raise animals well and you can raise them poorly so there is an environmental factor yes but yeah i'm just i'm just here to push back against this idea that everyone's like we should be eating as 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 few calories from meat as possible <laughs> and that just doesn't line up with the history of humans well i mean i think you make a good point though which is that we we live in this really uh weird modern context that is pretty distinctive from the way we evolved so I mean, all of the industry around meat eating and, and um, this idea that we can't find with great effort um, adequate substitutes from plants, I'm not sure that that's always been the case. I think that would have been the case in the past. I think that's the case for people who live in more traditional societies now. But when you have kind of access to modern technology, which is able to extract more protein, let's say, out of plant products than before, you can fulfill your protein requirements to a certain extent um, that way. And so I think that it's we shouldn't discount the fact that in the modern world, people who have access to modern technology might not have to rely on specifically, you know, dead animals to the same extent that we know for sure hunter gatherers do um, and that our ancestors did. But, you know, it, it's it's kind of one of those things where I would be hesitant to say, that specifically all of our protein has come from animals for example now i think we have more options than we did before with the with the whole vegan thing we accidentally go vegan every year we go into the field and it's it's mostly an expense issue because we live out in this kind of rural community in and this is in malawi which is in sort of central africa and people really don't have a lot of access to meat there at all it's a it's very much a luxury kind of good and it's where people store their social wealth because they keep these herds of animals and that's that's where there's a lot of, of wealth that that's involved in uh, marriage exchanges and all sorts of things so so actually killing and eating the animals is 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 not something that happens that often because it's more about moving the animals from family to family um and then it's just really expensive to to keep them and and actually to to buy the meat so when we're out there we try to eat the way everyone around us does and inevitably we Honestly, we we struggle a little bit because um, iron deficiency seems to be something that that happens pretty fast. And I kind of only really picked up on this. I, I noticed that the people in our field crew get really tired after being there for a while, a few weeks, you know, maybe a month and a half. And I thought that was just, you know, we're tired. It's an intense work schedule. But the last time we were there, I think I noticed it because I was actually pregnant and I was just trying to walk up this little hill. And I was totally unable to do it without losing my breath. And I was like, what is going on? You know, usually when you're in the field, you, you kind of get out of that sluggishness of being in the office and you start to get fitter and, and more active. And it was sort of the reverse was happening. So I, I asked someone to bring me some iron supplements. And as soon as I took those things, it was like night and day. You know, I was just back to normal. Everything was fine. 
it was incredible. I know this is a, you know, a personal anecdote, but it really made me think about what happens when people who are used to eating a particular type of diet suddenly find themselves in a really different dietary sort of situation. So switching from one diet to the other seems to have had a big impact, not just on me, but also on the whole crew, because they actually took my suggestion and had some iron supplements too, and it helped them. So it was kind of one of those um, re revelation moments when I, I realized that there's probably a lot of populations where people are acclimatized maybe is the better word than adapted to having different kinds of diets with varying degrees of meat. And then um, they kind of get used to it over the course of, of as they grow and develop. And then if they make a big dietary switch, it can have like an extra big impact on their on their physiology in a way that it doesn't for other people. I noticed uh, I was telling somebody about this and they said, I hope you didn't start giving iron supplements to the people who live there. And I, I said, no, I, I didn't. But why? And, and they said, well, because malaria is, is so prevalent in that area that if people have too much iron, um, they actually become more susceptible because they can transport the malaria plasmodium more, um, more rapidly. And so there's all of these crazy interconnections between diet, disease, and um, lifestyle, and, and socioeconomic ability to afford stuff that is like fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't even know. That was maybe a bit off topic and you might, you might delete it, but. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. It's all interesting. Well, I was just thinking about we, when I visited another unscientific sort of anecdote is that I saw people who subsisted on, yeah, mostly just the, the crops. They didn't want, yeah, the animals are valuable. I mean, they get the milk from them, but they don't want to kill them or they have, you know, it's once a year on a special occasion, they get to have yeah. a lot of meat, but they still get animal foods otherwise. But there, there was a stark difference in these groups that relied mostly on the plant foods and they they looked and acted like U.S. citizens, bent over arthritis. They had all these problems, like low energy. It, it was like a very different thing when we saw people that ate the more native diet, the more hunter-gatherer groups. These ladies were over 100, apparently, and they were dancing and jumping around. I don't know. This is just my... Uh, my thing is it's a bit of the like survive or thrive type of thing is yeah we can survive on different foods for short periods or on different diets but my my observation was that it takes a toll on your body in a different way i think it does i think um especially in the area where we work most people eat a lot of daily meals that are essentially breakfast lunch and dinner this uh crushed up maize meal and you know it's they basically call it a golly there as well they don't call it Igali there. Um, I know that that's what they call it up in Eastern Africa, but it's the same stuff. They call it Nsima. And, you know, some people like it, but but most um, international visitors find it a bit Play-Doh-like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then there's just this little bit of extra food that you have on the side they call the relish. And that might be some green stuff, or it might be, if you're lucky, it might be beans. We try to eat a lot of beans because that's like the the easiest way for us to get some kind of protein um, locally and you know the, there's also this sort of factor of when you're living in a community you don't want to be gross about it you know you don't want to come in with foreign money foreign research project and start killing cows and you know eating all the meat and having access to all of these luxury items it's just very um sort of uncool to do that mm -hmm. so you know the experience of kind of switching diets very rapidly has been um just personally pretty illuminating to me and i i don't think it's it's a great thing to have to eat the same thing every day all the time especially this highly processed stuff i i really think that there's a a big issue of inequality um it's not just about food security but it's about having access to a diversity of foods that so many people don't have the luxury of having for different reasons and in the united states it's it's also a socioeconomic problem but it's leading to different kinds of, of health issues, like, as you mentioned, obesity and, and diabetes. But it's the same core issue, which is lack of equitable access to the, a diverse food base. Yeah. And, and nutrient. Yeah. Nutrient density. Yeah. I mean, if you're also reading the same thing, you could be lacking tons of nutrients. And for sure, it's a good point. And yes, there's a lot of correlations between the the socioeconomic status and people's health and all that. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot we could have got into. We got to go, but oh man, I have one more question. I want to know about longevity because I don't know if you get into this much or if we even know because the the fossil record is so sparse 
And I'm just curious, like we know nowadays you can see humans, what, what it, some of them, right? That the standouts, the, the outliers live up to 120. Is there any reason why we couldn't have lived to 120 in the past? Like what, like what could, you know, why would a species just die off? Right? Like, like some people say, I don't want to get into a huge long topic because we're about to end, but you know, there's the average age of death compared to like, what's the most often age of death if they made it past 15 because so many people yeah. died in childbirth. So maybe just give me, give us a little bit on longevity. Cause I've always been interested in that. Oh, well, we should do another one on life history then, because I love this. <laughs> this mm -hmm. is uh, um, so, you know, life history theory is kind of just how can we understand how a species has evolved to have the particular timing of important events in their lifespan? Like um, how long are they in a period of infancy? How long are they in a period of childhood? How long are they in a period of adolescence? Um, you know, at what age do they die? All of these things are. And then how long menopause? Yeah, right. How long is, is what we call senescence, that sort of old age where you're not reproducing anymore, but you're still around? And why is that so extraordinarily long in humans? And these are all almost certainly tied in with all of the things I already talked about, brain size, sociality, um, even, you know, diet has, is, you know, they're, they're all connected to each other. So this is this is one of the most fascinating areas of research right now in biological anthropology, I think, is trying to understand those life history parameters. And when we get people always ask me, OK, so what does the fossil record tell us then? And and I always have these very disappointing answers, unfortunately, mm -hmm. because, you know, when you look at a skeleton of anything after it has achieved its adult growth, it doesn't change anymore, really. I mean, it can get arthritis and it can get tooth wear, but that's all very sort of situation dependent. Um, how much bone arthritis you have is often also a factor of how much um, work you do, repetitive workload. It's not just how old you are. So after a certain point, it's really hard to know how old anyone was um, from a skeleton at, at death. And that's a huge problem because in order to be able to try to understand the evolution of life history, we have to know how long an individual um, was able to live. And, and then of course there's the sample size problem, right? How are you going to know that you're going to get um, uh, you know, a sample of fossils that actually is representative of, of all the old people, all the middle aged people and so on at death. And, and that's almost impossible to imagine doing that. So what you can kind of do is you can come at it from the other end and you can look at childhood and you can look at the, the way that fossils of juvenile individuals, juvenile hominins, so they died when they were children or adolescents, you know, how, what kind of a stature did they achieve, for example, how long, uh, how large was their brain? You can kind of see the relationship between how prolonged the childhood was and then all of these other factors. And if it looks like they had kind of a long dependent childhood followed by this crazy adolescent burst the way humans do, or, or if they had a more ape-like life history in which they pretty much just kind of grow slowly and steadily until they're about eight, 10, and then they start reproducing after that. And so we can kind of start to see because these various life history parameters are often related to each other, we can look at the one end that's more visible in the fossil record, and that can give us some, some insight into the other end. Um, so one of the kind of ways of thinking about why it is humans live so long, this is a very popular hypothesis, the grandmother hypothesis, mm -hmm, yeah. um, you know, is, is that our old folks, not necessarily just grandmothers, um, might have played a really, really important role in ensuring that there was enough food around for um, other people in the community, and not just food, but also knowledge and the kind of ecological knowledge that hunter gatherers really rely on to be able to effectively exploit their habitat. So like, unlike a wildebeest that is born and like immediately knows how to eat grass, you have, um, humans are really exceptionally uh, extractive in the kinds of things that we have to forage for. It takes tons of social knowledge, ecological knowledge, knowledge about seasons, knowledge about, you know, what particular route you can find at what time of year and like what the vine looks like when it's above ground, when the animals are fat, where the animals will be. This is all stuff that's like thinking part of our diet and our subsistence. And that's very well developed in humans. And we use a lot of technology like spears and nets and stuff like that, as well as our social organization to make sure that we, we exploit um, foods in our natural sort of hunter-gatherer habitats, which means that hunter-gatherers don't become very, very good at it until they're about 25 to 30 years old. 
Um, the most productive members of society, therefore, are the ones that are actually on the older side, if you compare them to something like an ape. So if we start to look at kind of how long the childhood was in some of these fossil hominins, that can kind of tell us, or at least hint at how long the total lifespan probably was too, because you'd need to have older people living to be able to have that knowledge and be productive at an older age in order to actually make it possible for a prolonged childhood to evolve in the first place. Does that make sense? Yeah, kind of. So, I mean, so yeah, what is the culmination of that? Like, do, do you think we lived a long time for all of this human history? It looks like when you have Australopithecus, they still have a, a mostly ape-like life history. Um, Homo erectus is a little bit more human-like, but um, the, there was still a, kind of a shorter childhood. So if you kind of tack that on to human lifespans, you would not predict them to live beyond the age of probably about 50 or 60 years old on the basis of what you can tell about life history from the child fossils. And then it really does look like humans are exceptional in how long it is that we live. Um, there are, are now data from chimpanzees that are showing that even in the wild, they can live longer than a lot of people thought, but it's still pretty rare. Um, humans, on the other hand, we you know regularly live a very long time after our reproductive years. So it, it look, in terms of the maximum kind of possible lifespan, I don't know about that, but certainly the, um, the, the fossil record would show that we have been moving very much consistently over 3 million years in a direction where we're just living longer and longer and longer. And it's related to probably how important it is for us to have all this knowledge that we can use to get the kind of food we need. Well, yeah, well, I'll just if we can live to 120 now in our sort of bad modern lifestyle with bad foods and bad air and chemicals, wherever, you know, getting into us, then why wouldn't we have been able to live that long? Like, what is the cap on? on aging? Yeah. Yeah. Or like, why not? Like, I, it seems to me like we could have lived longer. Not that not m many people did it. There's so many things that could get them out there. But you know what I mean? Like, why wouldn't the maximum be 130? One, 140. I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, I don't think that the fossil record, as I understand it, is going to be very helpful no. about about answering it. But I, I, I agree that it's kind of like a mystery why, you know, it's a somewhat arbitrary cap. But don't most hunter gatherers, from, from my understanding, most hunter gatherers, even though they have the potential to live a lot longer, typically don't live, you know, beyond about 80, 85. It's still pretty rare. You know, it's not like it's, um, impossible, but it's rare. I mean, I know a 102 year old man in where we work in Malawi in a country where almost nobody, you know, lives beyond the age of 80. But so it happens, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the norm. And so it's kind of like, what, um, what are we doing to be able to have more of us be able to come closer to our potential long life that we could live um, versus just a few of us making it that far? And, and in a healthy, active way. Well, that's what I was going to say, and health span too. Yeah, I don't want to be in a hospital bed. But, and my last thought is, yes, we, we just can't know, looking at the skeletal remains, how old we are. And I just worry that sometimes we, we kind of just graph on, graft on what we see in modern humans and they have wear and tear. So we know, yeah, maybe modern human has all this arthritis or different, what their remains look like at 75. But what if back then that person was 105 before they got that wear and tear because they were so active and had the right diet and all that type of stuff? Yeah, Does when you look sense? at any, any of the skeletal record stuff, you'll always see that people are very cautious about it. So they'll say, oh, they were 50 plus. <laughs> you, yeah. know, you don't try to assign an age to any kind of a skeletal um, set of skeletal remains beyond the point at which you can confidently say it. And you know, you're right, you wouldn't necessarily be able to to know the difference um, from one or the other. And that, that's usually acknowledged in the way we have to collect the data, but it's not particularly helpful, unfortunately, in being able to reconstruct ancient demographics. What you can kind of look at more is how uh, the overall spread of ages of when people are are dying. So, you you know, you can you can definitely see if a larger proportion of the total population, if you have enough, a large enough sample, seems to be dying at, at younger ages or not. It, it does kind of look like that starts to happen more when you have agriculture. It, it kind of seems like people are having a lot more 
children um, and that they are, um, that child mortality is, is on the increase, um, stature is on the decrease as it's sort of a rough measure of overall nutrition in the same population. So considering it's the same genetic population, why are people on average starting to become a bit shorter over time? Um, you know, there's lots of things that happen with the origins of food production and as food production continues to sort of work its way through a society that don't seem to be particularly optimal for human health. And um, you do see that repeatedly, no matter where you're seeing agriculture and the emergence of agriculture, whether it's in the Americas or, you know, Southern Asia or Europe or, you know, one of these, you know, ancient sort of African kingdoms, like wherever you see it, it, it doesn't seem to always necessarily come with a great um, set of sort of health benefits overall for the society. And yet at the same time, you have a few individuals who are clearly benefiting, and that's probably because of the differential wealth that is starting to emerge with it as well. We just got into a huge topic. Maybe we do have to do another one at some other point. <laughs> because uh, we were discussing a book, Against the Grain, by James Scott, uh, that you didn't read, but I read, and yeah, it, it talks a lot about this. And I know there's other books. I mean, Jared Diamond talks about some of this stuff, or just it's just in the literature about how our kind of stature and nutrition declined uh, simultaneously when we started settling down and 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 yeah, raising um, well crops and also the accumulation of wealth. We can't get into that all. It's super interesting to me is is why it started happening and the, the power structure differences and oh. We could go on forever. I'm going to have to let you go, get, get back to your work. And thank you so much for spending all this time sharing all this great info with us. Uh, yeah. what What's next? You're going back to Malawi? Yeah, yeah. We'll be back in, in the summer. We'll be back in Malawi. And um, I'm just trying to uh, get all of my data together so that I can just keep writing because I, I have um, maybe I've I have too many interests <laughs> and I have a lot of different projects that are sort of in in the almost their phase and I need to just start pushing them out. Well, we'll look forward to seeing those. I know you have a website people can check out. I do. Yeah. Um, it's one of those campus press, um, websites. It's, it's kind of a long an unnecessarily long oh, URL, but I can link to it now. People, I mean, people can Google it, you know, Jessica Thompson. Yeah. I know. I think it's on a Yale domain. Yeah, it is. We'll put it in the show notes, but we can follow your work. And anything specific in Malawi you're studying this time? Well, one of the things that we're, yeah, okay. So now this is a whole other thing. This is the whole human environment thing, because we want to know how it is that humans, through those complex technological behaviors and, and ecological knowledge, might have had a role in actually shaping the environments themselves so that the environments we see today or the environments we reconstruct even in like the near past are actually a product of kind of human environment interactions rather than just like hunter gatherers living in their environments and passively doing whatever the environment dictates. But, but when and how did humans start to have a real managerial effect on their environments? And I'm, I'm doing one of those CARTA talks about how we transform from human, what did I call it? Um, environmental managers to ecosystem damagers. So it's like, you know, when did we transition into, into something that was, that was really um, not managing, but destroying. So anyway, that's kind of what we're looking at there is we want to, we want to look at the paleo environments. We've got a lot of really cool ancient DNA. That was a big result that came out earlier this year. Um, some of the oldest ancient DNA in Africa from those sites. And that tells us how human populations were kind of interacting with each other over the long term, and then um, what relationship did that maybe have to do with the way that they were dealing with um, environmental change, and then how were they actively having a role in changing environments? So it's like a bit of a complicated new research area. I love it. I love it. We'll have to check in maybe uh, in the fall when you get back, and uh, let, love to hear more. Thank you so much. All right. No worries. Um, let us know if there, you have any follow-up questions. All right. Oh. Did I 